Uh, okay. Yeah, it's your main man back here with uh, Seder, who's joining us to talk about Mage the Ascension. Mage! 20. Yeah, we, we got knocked off the Marauders themselves. Seems to be uh, unhappy yeah. with the disrespect he was paying them. We know, in fact, <laughs> that all that took the sheep, goats and sheep, there's problems there. He came in, he snatched them, the, the, the woolly girls up and had his own ways with them. Uh, but now we're back here. <laughs> the Your main man hit, hit the ring with a steel chair, cleaned up the Marauders out, and we have uh, so we're back here. With you, maybe a few technical things there, but we have resolved those at this time. So, uh, coming back. So, Marauder Sheep are apparently going to become a new, uh, become a new fixture in Mage. <laughs> Absolutely, Marauder Sheep. They're, they're they're going to be there. The, the idea of of uh, the Marauders is very interesting. We talked about the Marauders and the and the Malkavians, and and you know the facts there again. They don't play Malkavians cute and silly with with fish and and so forth. They, these are people that are troubled, that are disturbed, that are. Uh, uh, that are out there now. Before, before mm -hmm. you talked about the corruption. Oh, the uh, uh -huh. they are corrupt. The marauders are corrupt. But you didn't. Yeah, say, you certainly didn't say who is corrupt. Or in fact, the Nafani. You know, the Nafani aren't corrupt at all. The Nafani, if there is one true thing in the world, here <laughs> is the Nafani. We know the Nafani are secretly the good guys because the world itself is imperfect. Existence, reality is imperfect, and it must be undone. And they are doing the just thing to undo it. After all, reality and the horrible things that must be happened are of no, no importance at all. It's nothing real. Is it? Uh, so let, let, let's talk about the Nefaldi. Let's talk about uh, how they how they were and uh, Mage the, the the Ascension. It's second edition and lies. Let's talk about them and then how they go forward into uh, the, the 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 further uh, additions as we come out with with twenty and and the kind of ideas the roles you might have in your mind for Nefaldi. Well, on a whole lot of levels, we're we're already living with with the Nefandi. It's uh, actually I don't I don't want to I don't want to spill too many secrets from from Mage Twenty, but let's just say um, people think the the technocracy won the won won the Ascension War. No, no. As as I as I point out in in, uh, in Mage Twenty, when you've got three religions intent on destroying the world in the name of their god, the technocracy did not win. And, and and who actually stand a, a decent chance of doing it? The the Nefandi did not win. I rather I should say the, uh, the 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 technocracy did not win. Now the the Nefandi essentially repre re recognize that the greatest void is, is the, the greatest void, the greatest darkness is is the core of the human heart. It's not out there. It's in there, you know. And that's why they are so successful. And the most successful thing that the, the, I should say the thing they are most successful at is getting you to think that they're not. It's getting you to think that they're a bunch of just a bunch of idiotic, you know, death metal heads running around. Going, I summon you, Cthulhu. Ah, kill me now. But that's a diversion. No, I like I said earlier. You want to you you want to see an Ophandis? Watch Glenn Beck. You know, watch watch. Um, you know what watch. Um, I uh, just said earlier, you know, well, watch watch Dick Cheney. Watch that dude um, from I I forgotten which English bank it was, but that dude from from uh, from the bank last year who was like, you know, governments don't control the world. We control the world. Uh, no, it wasn't in English bank. It was uh, Goldman Sachs. The dude from Goldman Sachs. Governments don't run the world. Goldman Sachs runs the world. That's there's your nefandi. People just think that's the syndicate. There were reasons, and this this was something that I was going for in in Mage uh, in in uh, in Mage before um, before I left the line. But you see it; it's it's canon. It's in Void Engineers. It's in Syndicate. It's in uh, uh, Tales of Magic: Dark Adventures. It's in the, uh, the the Technocracy Guide. It's the idea that they're already there. <laughs> you know. People are people are fighting against the technocracy, thinking that the technocracy is this soulless monolith. No, the, the technocrats have a very good idea. They go too far with it. The traditions have a very good idea. They go too far with it. Where do they go? Guess. They, when Anne Rand, you know, who I mean, 
in real life now, you know, Anne Rand is seen as this this political philosopher by a substantial part of of, uh, of, of, of American popular culture, if nothing else. You know, who is John Galt? John Galt's a fucking offendist, idiot. John Galt is the guy saying, "You, you, nobody owes anybody anything. Nobody, you owe nothing to anybody else. Take what you can. Leave nothing left." As they said in Pirates of the Caribbean, or and and or give nothing back rather and that is that's an utterly nefandic viewpoint the the viewpoint that nothing exists but for your pleasure the idea that you have no responsibility no accountability your your nobody should have any effect on your life total freedom is the ability to do whatever the hell you want yeah well that's one of the that's one of the the, the, the Nefendi's most successful tools and most seductive tools. Uh, I definitely see, and and we talk about this in Book of Madness and and in uh, in Book of Shadows. There are definitely the low ranking Nefendi you know Nefendis going. Blah, 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 my dark lord. Blah. That's their diversion. Yeah. They're the ones that you send. That the, the hit marks go after them. So Dick Cheney can go. I will save this nation at any cost. We will declare war on this nation over here because they represent a threat to us. Uh, no, actually, the UN says they don't. Yes, they do. You know, we will go over here and we will do this thing. We waterboarding's not torture. Why no? That's what we need to do to remain safe. There is no problem whatsoever with the fact that I gave no big government contracts to my friends. Oh, I no. It's it's evil that the, the Democrats are trying to destroy us. It, pay no attention to the fact that I sent members of a militia that I own stock to to go kill American citizens in New Orleans. That's the thing you have to do. There's your nefandic voice. And so they're not an exaggeration. Uh, that's the scary thing about them. It's one of the reasons why I always said I was never going to do a player's guide to nefandi, was because... As someone who is actually a, who is actually pagan, who actually does to a degree believe in magic, um, as someone who has seen really intensely fucked up people do really intensely fucked up things in the name of magic, I did not want to, and still do not ever want to inspire or encourage anyone to think that that's cool, much less to to have anybody think, hey, I can do that. I'll I'll you know. This game told me to dismember the to dismember the, the neighbor's cat in the name of my forces fear. Those those people are rare, but they do exist. Um, there was someone who called uh, the White Wolf offices at one point, adamant that she had to talk <coughs> to the um, she had to talk to the author of the Book of Nod, and and we were like, the Book of Nod is fiction. She's like, no, it's not. Or like, did, did you want to talk to Andrew Greenberg? You know, he's the vampire developer. No, I want to talk to the real author. I want to talk to uh, to to uh, um, uh, Alistair De Laurent or Aristotle De Laurent or whatever his name is. It's like, no, that's a fictional character. No, it's not. It's real. Unfortunately, there are those people. They're they're very rare, but there are those people in in gaming circles who take the game too far, and I did not ever want to give those people material with which to go and fuck things up, most of all themselves. Um, at the same time, and I realized when I worked on Infernalism, The Path of Screams... Oh, we're getting um, to that. <laughs> he, he, I realized he's, he's got that, the gun on you folks, but it's right here, Infernalism. Yeah. <laughs> well, well you, you just jumped to it, so, so let, me, let, let me set this one up for the people at home. Infernalism, The Path of Screams. Now, you have two very distinct types of books in the in the world of darkness. You have your your, your core books, your supplement supplement books. See, you cannot compare a core book to a supplement book in any game. They're just completely different no. functionally items. In, in the entire White Wolf line, my favorite game is Vampire the Masquerade. My favorite supplement for all the lines, period, is Infernalism, The Path of Screams. And if you guys want to hear it, let me know in the comments below, and I will get a review of this up. I absolutely thank you. Adore this book. The artwork alone, this is the, I think, the shy. artwork you have in the entire White Wolf run. Old school, new school, it doesn't matter. This is absolutely amazing. 
the, the ideas and concepts discussed in this book are tremendous. It does have what you just talked about there, Sater, the, uh, the special note about don't worship Satan and go kill people, sleep tight at night. We, we, we do mm -hmm. see that. And, of course, there were some people that were connected to, to White Wolf, uh, not not to in terms of uh, uh, working there or anything like that, but there were there were killings. There were people who, who got way too strong and crazy on this thing. So I can certainly see where you would have uh, reservations as a player. You know, those kids in Louisiana, that was scary. Yeah, I mean, there were some very sick Confused. Florida, Florida, not Louisiana. They yeah, were heading Florida, to Louisiana. The, uh, the, I think they were. They drove down to Florida from maybe Kentucky. Well, they, they were from Florida. They were driving to Louisiana because they wanted to go join the Anne, Anne Rice, the vampire mother. It's no wonder Anne Rice left. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's the scary part. Actually, uh, a novel that I've been working on for some years called Holy Creatures to and Fro was initially inspired by the idea of of having a fantasy writer who creates something that is so... Um, that is creates something that strikes such a deep chord in her audience that her audience says we will live this way, and the main character, um, uh, the the main character Silk, has taken not only her name but her entire view of the world and her personality from this writer's books. And she says, "I know that this writer was writing fiction, but this fiction is true to me. I am Wolfkin. I don't actually change into a wolf." But this is who I am. This writer speaks to me, and that writer went holy fuck and ran. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah absolutely. And it is uh, a lot of people that didn't really get involved with the fantasy element. They don't have the, the tight wrapping to understand where uh, where where fantasy begins and where it doesn't. You know, you have people out there that worship Cthulhu for real uh, and think mm -hmm. the Necronomicon wasn't created by for real. Yeah. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's like sorry, dude, that was just a hoax made by one of Aleister Crowley's followers to. Steal your money, even if you mm -hmm. uh, don't buy it. What's wrong with you? Uh, so yeah, you certainly do have, unfortunately, that fringe element, which I think you guys put down to the. Uh, I don't. It doesn't say in this book, but in some moments, like the ninety-nine point nine 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 percent of you. Sorry, we had yeah. to in the book. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was an interesting. That alone is a, definitely a thematic change. You know, some of the the later uh, early White Wolf books, the, the special notes, the fact that oh shit, you know, we didn't expect to see that, but now it's here. We got to. Got to say, don't no, no kill it or somebody. I, I for one, though, yeah. the player who loves, and a game master who loves bringing those dark aspects to, mm -hmm. to have that an object blackness and those shades of gray, and then at the same time, be able to flip that and let's tell the story of, of, of what is black and why, and what's the motivation mm -hmm. for that, and getting into the to, to the idea of what is evil, what is an evil character, as opposed to the, the mustache twirling, where, where you know you have people that. Yeah. Don't, understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel my evil plan splat. Yeah. So we see There's, so much fodder in this book. Again, it furls the path of, uh, of the screws. You're going to have to go to eBay to get this. I recommend if you have a white wolf collection, you have to have this book. It is uh, tremendous. And you see what you're uh, talking it's on drive. It's on drive through RPG also. The PDFs of it are on drive through RPG. Yes. Drive through RPG. Go, go check that out. Yay, Mark. Mark Jackson. PDF, yeah. So you see, like, she. Completely normal looking. You could throw her in there in a gang girl book, anything like that. But then you have you have other images of, in here of people that can't just walk down the street, and you have that right. that great uh, juxtaposition of obscenity and normality side by side, and that really speaks to what informalism really is, and what you were talking about earlier with the politician Dude, and the, the, the gibbering cultist. But yeah, yeah the, the, the one flaw in there, he looks, you know, the, I, I forget what it was, like horrendous or hideous or something like that, but the description of it, you look like a John Cobb drawing, you know? Yeah, it's uh, it's just, 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 just a very, very interesting book. I, I would like to, to start with this book. Where where do your initial inspirations come for this? For this <laughs> but, uh, well, yeah. well, for starters, I was furious when I wrote it. I was so angry, and I'm, I'm not I'm not going to get into why because it's it's ancient history at this point. But when I when I say when I said earlier that I'd gotten really really burnt out by the late '90s, I'd gotten really burnt out, and I. I was a very angry person. I was sick of myself. I was sick of White Wolf. I was sick of Mage. There, when you when you go back and you look at the later books that I did for Mage, um, you can see that I'm I'm tearing it apart. One of the reasons I'm tearing it apart is because um, I feel like yeah, you know, there were certain ideas early on in Mage that were that that were awkward and and dumb. Um, Thanatos, Dream Speakers, um, that needed significant retooling. 
And then there was just the sense that I had done by, by 1998 roughly 80 books, uh, had done, you know, at least a book a month from age. And I was just, I was angry at myself. I was angry at people there. I was angry at the company. I was angry at a lot of stuff. And when I, when I finally stepped away from White Wolf and was, was doing it uh, freelance, and I, I, I said, you know, I have to address this for Sorcerer's Crusade, if nothing else, because Infernalists are, are one of the big bads in Sorcerer's Crusade. I said, I have to, I have to explain, not explain, I, I explain is such a passive word. I have to, to illustrate, I have to reveal, is, is a good word, um, what this really means. What is evil? And I, I started to get into, you know, what, what is evil, and more importantly, why do people do evil things? And as, as I said, in Infernalism, The Path of Screams, if you know that damnation's not just some existential joke, if you know that demons are real, if you know that by dealing with a demon you will be damned, there is a hell, there are lots of hells actually, that this is not an abstract concept, it is real, why would you do it? This reason, this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. This, especially when you get into the the, the, the late the, the late uh, mid medieval period, there are a whole lot of really legitimate reasons that somebody would do that, because even hell would be an improvement over what life was like for those people. Um, but more importantly, I wanted to make it. I wanted to make Infernalism a book about anger and fear and hate and why everyone has them. And it's what you do with, with your anger and your fear and your hate. So for me, uh, infernalism was an act of, of emotional and creative and intellectual catharsis. I was taking all this stuff that was running around in me and just going, <clears throat> and I had this, this, this horrific soundtrack um, of just the most vile, darkest music in my collection, which was saying something. Um, and... And I was just had by I, at that point my my now former wife Wendy and I were living in a house. She was at work all day, and I just had my my office, and I had my speakers going full you know full volume at, at you know Black Sabbath was the least of it you know Cannibal Corpse and Catalepsy and um, Napalm Death and Christian Death and Cradle of Filth and stuff like that, and I'm just going I need to exercise my hate, so I did. Um, and then I made fun of it in the next book that I did, which was um, uh, reignofevil.com for, for Aberrant. Um, I took, I treated the anger and the fury and the, 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 the loss and everything seriously in Infernalism. Then I turned around and made a joke of it in reignofevil.com, where the, the, the subtitle to it was just because it's pathetic doesn't mean it's not dangerous. Um, and then I stepped away, you know, for a while. And my next thing, really, my next major creative work after that was was Deliria, which was tonally 180 degrees away, you know, from from uh, from Infernalism. I just felt it was really important to get beyond the the booga 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 my feel my dark powers stereotype of what evil is, because as I've said several times before, evil and by evil I don't mean as a metaphysical thing. I mean as a thing that people choose to do with malice of forethought, is a, a daily part of our world. Um, we are lucky enough in, a, in the United States to not, to not live with the effects on a daily basis unless we follow politics. But man, tell somebody in Iraq or, or in Afghanistan um, or in Sierra Leone that evil doesn't exist. You know, tell them, tell that to 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 people in in, uh, in Bosnia. Tell them to, tell tell them that in Germany. You know where they're still recovering from from a national spasm of evil, and I don't mean evil as in this big satanic thing came when and say I will now dangle my puppet Hitler, but where people choose to do atrocious things. That was an, an essential element of infernalism, and it will be it has it always has been, but will especially be uh, an important element of the treatment of of the Nefandi in in Mage Twentieth is people choose to do these things. They're not being they're not being played. They choose. Why? I think that's an important question to ask, even with even in fantasy. So that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, anyone that uh, it's a drive-through RPG or 
get yourself a copy of this. This book really goes into some wonderful ideas. You know, the Fomori in here, the, uh, the Infernalists, some very interesting stuff. And I, 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 again, like I said, this is this is my favorite book from any of the supplements, the entire, you know, not just maybe the entire book. I thought it was just wonderfully written and very evocative of the mood that you put across. <laughs> Which was fucking pissed. I, I, I freak well, myself out with some of the stuff I wrote in that book. <laughs> huh? Yeah, well, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I freaked go. myself out with some of the stuff I wrote in that book. That bit with the, uh, the, the bit oh. with the torturer and the, the, the singing flies oh. around the dismembered, uh, among the dismembered corpse. Um, something else that was a major influence, and I, and I quoted it several times, um, Throughout there was the um, the the songs of Maldoror, um, which was I, I got my hands around the time that I was writing Infernalism. I got my hands on a a collection of of uh, of decadent literature, not decadent in a, oh wow that's decadent, but in the yeah. decadent movement, the literary and artistic movement of the 1800s, and I was reading you know Comte de, uh, de la Tremont, which I probably murdered the pronunciation there, but you know and Poe and Beardsley and um, the people who were uh, Baudelaire, uh, Rimbaud, the people who were going, okay, I'm going to push the boundaries of excess because that's the only place where I'll find truth. And I was reading that and going, yeah, I got your truth right here. <laughs> and then I, I, I looked at what I'd written after and said, wow, dude, fuck, did you write that, man? <laughs> so, yeah, that. Absolutely. Now, we talked a little bit in the uh, the first video, and if you haven't seen that one, you're definitely going to want to check out the first video that we did here in this, this series where we encountered a little uh, technical glitch. We talked about um, <clears throat> the, the traditions, and I know that you did a lot of work. I think, I think it's fair to say, did you do more work on the Cult of Ecstasy than any other tradition? Is that the one that you really dug into the most? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Part of, part of the reason is because the person I'd originally contracted to write the book choked up a hairball on it, and I ended up writing it myself in about two weeks. Um, another one of those just, I can't stop and think about it, I'm just doing it. And halfway through the book, I realized that I was describing myself. Um, up until that point, I always thought of myself as a verbena because I was very, I was fairly militant pagan when I first got involved in Mage, which was actually one of the reasons why I made a point of going this is not real. This is not real. This is not real. Because this is no. This is only a few years after the whole bothered about Dungeons and Dragons thing. I said, yeah. I do not want Mage to become fodder for the next Pat Pulling. I want to make sure that whatever I do, that it is the that the intention the intention is clear. I do not want to be that magic that occult game master who puts occult textbooks into hands of children in the forms of games. I do not want to be that person. Um, so I deliberately stayed away from putting uh, uh, to putting mystical content in there beyond the think for yourself, believe for yourself element. Um, but when I hit the cult of ecstasy, I was like, "No, I really believe this." You know, I don't actually believe I can step through time, obviously. But in terms of the the approach, in terms of experientialism, in terms of saying that you have to, sometimes you have to transgress to turn the world on its on, on its head to truly understand. I believe that. That's the way I live. I don't do a lot of drugs, but I have done some. Um, I've done them to expand, you know, I've done them to find out, you know, what, what my world looked like afterward and then came down and said, okay, well, this. Um, I don't run around screwing everybody, that, everybody who crosses my path. I, I don't, you know, I'm not a womanizer or anything, but I do enjoy sex. Um, it is, and sex is not just a, let me get my rocks off, baby, thanks. The sex is sex, sensuality, they are communions to me. Um, and I realized while I was doing the, the, the stream of consciousness, read, write, read, write, think, read, write, on the cult of ecstasy, that, that I was writing the truest book, except maybe for The Fragile Path that I'd written up to that point. And obviously I didn't write The, the Fragile Path all by myself, I did write Cult of Ecstasy. Um, I also felt the cult really, really needed a f all of the traditions needed major, major over overhauling from first edition. Um, the ones presented in first edition are, are one-dimensional and frankly embarrassing at, at times. Um, the dream speakers, oh look, it's the colored people tradition over here. Ugh. Um, 
you know, things like that really needed to be fixed. And especially after the, the, the clusterfuck of the Akashic Brotherhood tradition book, first edition, I said, oh, it was horrible. I have to make sure that we know what we're writing about from now on. Um, that wasn't entirely Emery's fault. There was somebody else who was supposed to be writing it with him who bailed, and Emery ended up having to, to make do with what he could in, in a few weeks. But it's a horrible book, and I wanted to make sure that everything we did with the traditions from then on went deeper than that. It was better than that. Um, so each tradition book after, um, really after Sons of Ether, um, we, I tried to put more into those 72 pages, and which really had the art department wanting my head at certain points. But with Cult of Ecstasy, I felt like I finally hit the balance. But the Cult of Ecstasy really needed an overhaul from its first edition incarnation because they were a bunch of stoner hippies. And I was like, no, that's, that's not what it's about. It's not about vice. It's about tools to change your perspective. And so in, in that sense, I identified more strongly with, with the Cult of Ecstasy than with anybody else. But, but the C of E book was a turning point for the line, I feel, on a lot of levels because it was the first time that I felt we'd really actually gotten it right. Um, I feel like the tradition books after that, Dream Speakers is very, very good. Um, Euthanatos is very, very good. Um, Order of Hermes is as good as we could make it in, in 72 pages. Um, I actually I prefer the second edition Order of Hermes, which is twice the word count. Hmm? The second edition Order of Hermes is a very good book. It, well, when you're looking at the first edition books for... Uh, even in the, in the clan books and so forth, you get a lot of variance between really good and just really terrible books. Uh, and, and that's what I was going to call ecstasy of those traditions, particularly at that time, on that second edition line. The, uh, those, some of those tradition books are not worth buying or reading. And, and, but the Cult of Ecstasy, I think, stands out head and shoulders better than the rest of them. And hearing all the personal aspects of yourself, you just sort of opened up and, and fed through. Of course it's going to come out so well because it... It, it, like you said, it was almost real to you, which... Yeah, I had been to Burning Man for the first time a few months before I wrote that, which, which obviously made its way into the book. Yeah, and that's, just, you know, I mean, you, you could see it, but looking at the original Cold Exity book, and the second is Cold Exity book, I think also very good. The tradition, quite honestly, of the nine traditions you have, I think Cold Exity come out head and shoulders better than the rest of them. Uh, followed by Order of Hermes, but a Cult of Ecstasy really uh, very, very successful. Like you can, you can see these these people in the world. You can understand them and how how they get they get to a certain place. And the journey being a member of the Cult of Ecstasy is quite can be quite entertaining playing that character. And there's so many ways you can take it, which are really uh, mm -hmm. really really fascinating. So I think they were really massive success. Let me talk to you about a group that I'm going to be interested to see how you do them. In hmm. the twenty, the hollow ones. Now the hollow ones are quintessentially, quintessentially early ninety. You know, I mean, they are um, Bella Lugosi dead in the form yeah. of flesh. They are the bats in the belfry. And they are the temple of love. Uh, they are gothic to the point of uh, almost uh, being pretty. Pawns. How do we now? We don't have that sort of same culture. I don't know. You know, if they've been gone completely emo or what the deal is with them, but we saw that culture, of course, in the early to mid '90s, where those people we could go out and say, "Okay, there's a Hollow One type." We don't really see that anymore. Where do the Hollow Ones go? What do you do with them in this edition? Well, it's part of, and, and actually, we're we're kind of getting at in twentieth twentieth anniversary. Well, this is one of the things that Rich and I talked about when we were first hashing it out. 20th anniversary is is walking a is walking a tightrope between the 90s mage and 2013. Um, one of the things my initial uh, my initial proposal was for a this is mage 2013, and Rich said that's a great idea. Let's do that. But people who love mage 20 years ago want their classic mage. So what I'm doing in mage 20 is is walking 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 a line, frequently dancing a line. Uh, between 1993, uh, 2003, and 2013, and giving giving the readers, the players, the option of choosing what time and what type of setting, almost playing a, a Quentin Tarantino type of game with time. You know how, how in a Quentin Tarantino movie, it'll be part 70s, part 90s, 
with a little you know, 80s thrown in there, you know, um, uh, Inglorious Bastards, where you have David Bowie and World War, you know, David Bowie song in World War II. Um, I'm kind of doing a similar thing with Mage 20, where if you want it to be 90s Mage in 2013, you know, then golf clubs are still big and people are still listening to Sisters of Mercy. Um, if you want to do 2013, they're a little bit different. Um, but in terms of the way that, you know, is the more than just a hollow goth stereotype. And if you I'm sure you've seen the the Orphan Survival Guide, um, where we really wanted to flesh out the no, these aren't just, you know, um, hot topic rejects here. Oh, yeah. These are people who are connecting with feeling like they are walking through a hollow world. The, there's the element of self-mockery, the element of self-parody, the element of making fun of everybody else. There is the romantic decay, but there's also the dancing in the ashes of the world around you. That element hasn't changed. Um, it's maybe more romantic goth. There's definitely a steampunk element to it now, but that element of dancing through the ashes of you know dancing through the ashes of the world and you know kind of tossing them around like confetti going look we're all doomed yay that's still that that's been a part of the hollow one since before the sisters of mercy and has remained one even now that Andrew Elverich is a, a flabby white wearing lip syncing parody of what he was 20 years ago God, I hate that dude. <laughs> I went to go see the Sisters of Mercy on a reunion tour back in, I think it's 2000, 2001, something like that. And the son of a bitch showed up in like this John Travolta white suit lip syncing while two guys played unplugged cars to, to a badly synced up soundtrack of his greatest hits. And I'm like, I blew $50 and missed the damned for this? I, I, I love... I love the sisters' old late 80s, early 90s stuff, but Andrew Eldridge is slime to me. Anyhow, sorry, digression, I speak tangent. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> you do speak tangent, understand tangent right here. That is the alignment. <laughs> no, I assure you. Uh, let's talk about games that have that multitude. I'm sure you've seen them. Hell, you've probably played in one at some point, and then I'm going to see if you've come to the same conclusion that myself and others have, where someone goes, well, I'm just going to run. World of Darkness, and you got somebody makes a uh, bruja in tribute, and then you have another guy playing a um, a, a werewolf Ronin. Then you have uh, the Order of Hermes made, and for for no apparent reason, the changeling. Uh, the the these sort of games. What would be your 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 thoughts on them? What would be your your ideas? And I, I think that typically the absolute worst World of Darkness games that have ever been committed upon the world have been the just do whatever you want, bring whatever you want, and then the, the fact that yeah. it's either a PvP or uh, stilted, disjointed, unbelievable style of play, and so forth. I've got my holy yeah. were dinosaur and my oh, Bruja, yeah. true Bruja anti-tribute with Temporalis 8 and, and the... Uh, um, and the, the Akashic Brother and the Black Spiral Dancer, and, and they fight crime. Oh! It's the, uh, it's the, the yeah, Macaulay... Wait, my short version, please stop. Um. <laughs> it's the, the anti-tribute La Sombra uh, Macaulay Abomination. That is, the in, in our gaming group, uh, the utter height of, of ludicrousness. That just means you're... Yeah. you're well, please stop it. You don't mean that anti-tribute La Sombra Macaulay Abomination. No, go away, please. Uh, but yeah, let, let, let's talk about that a little bit. How how horrible it goes, why it doesn't work, and when it can work, and where it can work. Well, it can work when you do what we were talking about a little while ago about common ground. You know, if you've if you've got, and I, I like what Mark said on this last week, or maybe it was earlier this week. Yeah, but so you know, when Mark was saying that that they weren't, you know, that that the only way that they would work is if you put if you had the end of the world or some sort of similar scenario where these disparate characters really needed to, to work together. I think it depends a lot on the characters and the game. Um, my perspective on what Mark had said the other day was not so much that it was that the different developers were, were going in, in different directions. Not exactly true. We were uh, Bill, Andrew, myself, Jennifer, and Ian actually worked quite a bit on making sure that are you know, that that you could put 
our characters together, that, that, the, that the game rules actually were compatible. First edition Werewolf, first edition Mage, and first edition Vampire had different rule systems. They were not compatible. Um, it was Bill, Bill Bridges and, and my decision to, to follow, to, to retool the, the World of Darkness rule system, the story tool system, to follow in, uh, in, in Vampire uh, second, uh, second Edition, to make them all so that they were cross-compatible. But we, we spent a lot of times in one another's offices going, so how can we get this together with this without fostering a generic World of Darkness game? Because we wanted to have it that people could combine the games, and certainly the rules were as compatible as possible. But at the same time, we wanted to make it you know, distinctly different that you didn't just have a World of Darkness game where your where McCauley, where your your Macaulay anti tribute is anti tribute. Excuse me, and I want you to play it because we we got to hear it. The anti tribute Masombra Macaulay abomination. Ugh, hard. <laughs> the Macaul. Uh, what? Where, where did we start there? The Lasombra <laughs> anti tribute Macaulay abomination. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, with mage spheres. With mage spheres, yeah. Well, he Daniel have, Hate was a joke, really not. A, huh? It does he really need them? It's, it's Godzilla with obtenebration. What? what yeah. Yeah. Oh God, that, that's a great way of putting it. Man, that's the thing. Man, Samuel Hate was a joke. It was yeah. a joke that went on too long, but it was a joke. Uh, the funny thing is when people take some of the stuff that we did too seriously, like the Rasputin thing, people will be like, why is, I don't understand, Rasputin oh, is God. this and he's this and he's this. He's like, that was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, and I, this, this kind of goes back to the Hollow Ones in a way too, because it's an intrinsic part of both goth and punk that there's both a, an underlying seriousness and yet a sense of, 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 of humor. A self, frequently self-mocking sense of humor, and that was very true of our approach to the world of darkness. Um, we took it on one level; we took it very seriously, and on the other level, we were laughing, you know. And we wanted people to laugh along with us. And sometimes, like with Black Dog Game Factory, the joke was apparent. And sometimes with Rasputin, it wasn't as obvious. Um, and the, the 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 Hollow Ones kind of being, you know, an example where. This is supposed to be funny, but there's a serious undertone to it, but it's still funny. Um, where that goes with, with the, the, the whole, you know, World of Darkness crossover games is just making sure that there's a common ground between them that works for the characters and the story. Um, not just a bunch of characters thrown together in a room. Because that, that doesn't work whether you're talking about the World of Darkness or Dungeons and Dragons or you know, a, a TV show or a novel or whatever. Dropping a bunch of disparate characters who have nothing in common into a room together only works if, you know, only works if what you're doing is, you know, like seven characters in search of an author making a commentary on the limitations of narrative. You know, otherwise it's just chaos. That being said, you could come up with an idea where, oh my god, this thing is happening and the following creatures get together if only for, you know, if only for a few minutes. The Marvel, the Marvel Comics team-up approach. Um, but, and I think Mark, Mark hit this really well the other day. Um, one of the things that, that um, World of Darkness fell prey to a lot, and in the books as well as in games, um, was an atmosphere of chumminess where that which is scary or that which is, is awesome suddenly just becomes another character. And that was, that was one of the reasons, actually, that I got kind of tired of doing it, was, was trying to explain to people, no, but, but I see it like this, and ultimately realizing it's a role-playing game. It is interactive entertainment. Ultimately, all we do is provide a framework. What people do with that framework is their decision. And it's not for us to tell people what they, what kind of game they should or shouldn't play. And that's one of the reasons I keep going back to role playing as as a medium. I mean, I've worked in comics, I've worked in nonfiction, I've been a journalist, um, I write short stories, I've worked on novels, I've written screenplays. But I keep going back to role playing games, and one of the reasons is because as a medium, ultimately there's a point where it leaves your hands as a creator. And you go, okay, you, the audience, are the creators also. What do you want to do with it? 
And so, you know, it's, it's we can go, oh my god, true Bruhi, NT Tribu, you know, where dinosaurs, but at the same time, if that's what people enjoy, it's their decision. Let's just don't come to us telling us that, that the game is broken afterward if you choose to break it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, well, let's talk about this later. The yeah. is Mage, and we see the, the, the theme going through a lot of these games. You, you get pieces and pieces. Vampires really don't know what's going on. They are very mm-hmm. much rooted in their, oddly enough, the very shallow end of the world of darkness. And the werewolves, you see it expanded out into this, this trinity design mm-hmm. with the, 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 the weaver and the wild and the world. And then we really see that expanded out, the idea of uh, the power of the mind, the power of the soul, the avatar in Mage. And then when it really gets into explaining and exploring the Umber and then some of the books that, that talk about that, everything from the land of the wraiths to that high astral, mm-hmm. those, the imagination of what will exist and what is beyond the horizon. So his Mage and its cosmology cosmology of darkness. Uh, are they the ones who get it to the highest degree? And this is this is what that people are asking constantly. I think I had about ten people put this question. <laughs> it, it depends on it depends on your definition of of, uh, of highest, doesn't it? I mean, ultimately, the core idea of mage is you know reality is as you see as you see it. Um, if you see it as a five hundred year old vampire to to whom everything is a jihad. Then that's your reality. If to and this is something Bill Bridges and I in particular talked about a lot. We we said you know one of the 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 kind of the, the odd metaphysical tension between werewolf and, and mage, which was partly intentional, uh, is that the werewolves are functioning like like Mark said the other day. You know this kind of this Iron Age, Bronze Age sort of mentality of the tribe and the and the myth and the struggle against the predator. I am the predator, but the worm is my predator, and and we are we are locked in an eternal battle of against the the predation of the spirits and and our own demon or our own uh, animal nature and so forth. And then there are the mages who go. So what do you think it is? You know, and every faction and this this was completely intentional, uh, both satire and and seriousness on my part is going, okay. You ask the cultist of ecstasy, she's going to tell you one thing. You ask the hermetic, he's going to tell you one thing. You ask the man in black, he's going to tell you one thing. You ask that that crazy dude with his with his spirit sheep over there, he's going to tell you it's one thing. And you know what the weird thing is? They're all right. No one of them is totally right, but they're all right. Um, I've mentioned this. I mentioned this a lot in in articles and so forth. I'm actually giving it a section in um, page twenty, the Rashomon effect. Um, I think you're, you personally are probably familiar with it, but for the folks out there who, who aren't familiar with it, Rashomon is a Japanese, it was originally it was a play and then it was a movie uh, by Akira Kurosawa. Rashomon is a story about a crime that is, and after the crime, people are trying to figure out who did what to whom. And so they ask the participants in the crime, and then there's a guy off to the off to the side who said, "I saw what really happened." And all four of the characters have four, or four or five. It's been a while since I've seen it, but they all have totally different versions of what happened. A guy is dead. Another guy killed him. That guy had sex with the dead man's wife. Every other detail is different. And everybody, the dead man's ghost has one story. The murderer has one story. The the dead man's wife has a has a story. The guy who claims he was a bystander has a story. It is four. Um, and they they're all telling the truth as they understand it. And one of the guys at the end of the movie goes, oh, "What is truth? We can't know what truth is." That is one of the cores of mage. Ultimately, truth is too big for any one set of eyes, no matter how enlightened you you are or you think you are. So everybody is right to a degree. Everybody is wrong when they think that they have the only the only uh, idea of what reality is. So. The short answer to your to your question is reality is what you think it is. If you're a mage, reality is much, much bigger. What you can do with it is bigger, but you're still working within your you're still working within your and here comes the P word, the other P word, paradigm, which I, I have a section on paradigms actually in Mage twenty. Um, but you're still working within your belief system. Your model of belief paradigm means a model of a model of something that 
a model that explains how something works. Um, and a paradigm is, is a belief system, essentially. A mage paradigm is a belief system that says this is the way the world works. All the mages have a different paradigm. Many mages of similar groups have different paradigms. This mad scientist from the Sons of Ether is going, you fools, I'll prove you right. Here is my theory, and I, this is why I can prove that my theory is correct. And this other Son of Ether is going, but wait, my theory is correct because I can prove dot, 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 and they can both prove they're right. <laughs> they're both right because yeah. they're both mages. Um, and so the... The core, you know, the, the 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 core, you know, reality in mages. What do you think it is? So that I know this wasn't your idea, but you're talking about what you think it is. And we were talking about things that were bad. What I thought when I opened up the uh, mage, the, the first mage, the number one thing that jumped out at me as being broken was the idea of study points. The fact that you already oh, yeah. you white wolf, depending on how you. How, if you run one of those games that goes day after day after day after day after day after day, the experience system in White Wolf overall slants your character up to being really overpowered. Yeah. Uh, note, note that I did nothing with, stu with study points. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I completely uh, ignored that. That's one of those things that I was just like, rule. Yeah, it, it, was, it was gone, and I believe everyone gone. was happy to see it gone. Like I said, you already had, perhaps, you already had a high amount of experience, and there are a lot of... Storytellers out there that, that go above that, you know, two or three points mm -hmm. is perfectly fine. Don't give people eight or nine, and then wonder why you're, you have characters that are completely overpowered and broken mm -hmm. into the, the campaign. Um, they, they, you know, can definitely be so. I mean, adding a study points, just you know, it was it was the first thing yeah. into the book. I said, well, this is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was. So it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> As far as I'm aware, and I haven't read all of the revised books, but as far as I'm aware, nobody ever picked that back up again. No, I don't believe that was ever picked up. Now, the other thing for World of Darkness is Avatar. This idea, mm -hmm. wonderful. I love the Avatar, the way you can play off. You can have that role-playing scene with yourself. You could ask people's mm -hmm. avatars around and have, you know, mm -hmm. go play in a game, you can play my avatar, I play your avatar. Or you have the Game Master uh, run these, these scenes of the avatar. You can, you can use them. As an, or you can use them as, a, as an experience, as a memory, as flashes, as, as mm -hmm. uh, snippets. Um, well, it, it's sort of part of the story. And I saw that idea sort of being called mm -hmm. in some of the, the later White Wolf games, uh, which, in my mind, a lot of them weren't as strong as even the Fallen or mm -hmm. uh, the, the later version of Mummy, not the earlier one, where it, it seemed very similar to Mage. I don't know if you had that idea as well, but. They really seem to have kind of taken the avatar idea and sort of piled it up a little mm -hmm. bit, sort of stuck it in there as, as the prime you know, aspect of what is a demon, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what is the mummy? Did, did you did you see did you see a, a correlation there, or, or do, you, do you think that they're you know they're a whole scale a different deal? Uh, I've never read Demon, and I, I haven't. I've only, the only version of Mummy I read was the very first one, the one that uh, Steve Wick wrote back in. 92. Are you talking about the old um, mummy? Yeah, completely different. Yeah, movie. yeah. So I, I have, I have no idea. I'd stopped reading them by that point. Um, I do feel, and and obviously the the one that you hadn't mentioned, but is is the the the, the, the most obvious one there, the uh, the shadow in. Uh, um, here we go. This is Cupid wants to say hello. Say hello, everybody. This is my Cupidian. He's he's been trying to get my attention for the last five minutes. Um, but um, is but is is the the, uh, the the shadow in mage? I mean in mage rather in wraith. Right, yeah. um, and I think what we're we're going to you know and a, a, a the Jungian concept, the idea of the uh, the suppressed self that you know that Freud explained as you know the the the, the, the tripart you know id super id ego super ego that part where you're you know where you're having conversations with yourself. Or there are parts of yourself that you know you say, "Well, that's not me. I would never do this thing I just did." Oops. Um, we did consciously put some of that in um, to the to the world, you know, to the World of Darkness games. Avatar, when it was originally pitched in first edition, was a very nebulous sort of. A, you're a shard. This is your shard of the pure ones. What the fuck is that? No, no, you know. People have different explanations as to what the avatar would be. Well, what the avatar is to me is the avatar is the aware self. 
the avatar is the part of yourself. Whether you, if you subscribe to the idea of reincarnation, then it's your your previous incarnation going. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's that's a problem. Hold up. Um, or if that's a thing you want to do. That thing. Um, if you subscribe to to the idea of you know if if you're you know looking at it from a from a Christian standpoint, it's the inner Christ or maybe the inner devil, the the angel and the devil on your shoulders. Going, which way are you going to choose? Um, it could be, you know, the, you could look at it as the force of oblivion acting through you if you're, uh, if you're in a fandus or whatever it is. But or um, in going back to Cult of Ecstasy, um, Cassie eventually realizes in her moment of awareness, though she's a mage by that point, her moment of awareness is when she realizes that her avatar is her future self. Nobody can see. Uh, nobody can see Arya except her. Nobody interacts with Arya except for her and Wolf. Wolf can see Arya because Wolf's got time vision, um, but our Cassie, Cassie's moment of, real, of realization at the end of Cult of Ecstasy is, I am my own avatar, and that's kind of the the way that the way that I personally look at that. Whether you call it the shadow, whether you call it the avatar, whether you call it the Ba or whatever, it's that going back to aspecting that we were talking about a few hours ago. It's the part that you can set aside and go, hmm. Okay, and it's looking back at you, going, "Hmm, okay, let's have a conversation about who we really are." Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's really just wonderful thing to do narratively with with the idea of the concept. I, I, I'm a, a big fan of the idea of avatars. I think they, Thank you. It, it works out well, and it, it, it definitely became more streamlined as the game goes along. But it's still, like you said, maybe enough. To where you can just you can use it a lot of different ways, particularly the higher the point value you get, mm -hmm. you can construct the narratives differently. And after all, like I said, who well, I like as a player or as someone who the game more, what's going to help me make the game better? What's going to help me have high, intense, mm -hmm. interesting, interactive um, scenes that they can really uh, carry uh, the, the the fun there? Um, what you know, we've really we've really gone over. Uh, Mage and, and so many great, wonderful questions here. Now I know that you can also do some work with Changey Breed. Can you kind of give us <laughs> an overall? Do you, do, you, do you mean Bastet, uh, Bastet in the original World of Darkness, or do you mean Cha World of Darkness Changing Breed for the new World of Darkness? Well, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let, let's start with the um, in the old World of Darkness. Kind of wondering, like, just to get your get your feeling there. A lot of times the, the Changing Breed stuff was. A lot of them are very out of place. They were clearly not mm -hmm. like an originally intended idea. A werewolf is this horror icon. Everyone knows what a werewolf is. But bringing these other ideas in, they were some of them seemed very out of place. Particularly at getting some of them moved into to, to being very to, to being very well done. Uh, and some of them are, are very interesting. Like if you look at Rakia, that book is excellently written. It's a high mm -hmm. book, but. You know, there are probably not very many Rokia games that have ever been played out there. But then some of the other books from the line are very, very interesting reads. Yeah, well, that's unfortunately what happens when you when when you give somebody three cents a word and tell them they've got to have the book to you in two months. Yeah, that's I I, I had a, ended up having a, a a bit of a discussion with somebody on on uh, the Mage Twenty um, Facebook group. A few days ago, because he was saying, you know, Islam is totally absent in Mage. I'm like, no, actually, it's not this book, this book, this book, this book, this book, this book, this book. But the fact of the matter is, is I I wanted to have more about Islam, but especially after that that the the, the Akashic Brotherhood tradition book, I said I would rather not do a culture at all than do it badly. And as as I mentioned in that thread. Um, Game writers, especially uh, American American game writers, circa 1994, 95, um, had a kind of a you know you, you didn't exactly find a lot of Muslim game uh, you know Muslim game writers in 1995 or people who were intimately familiar with with the ins and outs of of Saudi Arabian culture um, that you could pay three cents or four cents a word to and, and actually get something coherent. Um, in the case of all, this is true of all gaming books in general, but especially the White Wolf books, um, it's it was is never been a, a well-paying market. It's a horrible-paying market now. Oh my God! But even back during its best days, 
you know, you weren't able to hire scholars to write this stuff. Uh, you weren't able to hire literary geniuses to write this stuff. Um, most of us were doing what we could with what we had, and that's true of the you know of not just of the changing breeds, but the, the splat books, any of the source books really. Um, sometimes you'd get a moment where, like with the Cult of Ecstasy book, I was inspired enough and connected enough with the material where I was like, "Wow, okay, I'm I'm writing about myself here," and I'm false modesty aside, a good enough writer that that it created a fairly decent book. Uh, other times you get a situation like with the Akash Brotherhood book where um, I had two friends, you know, both white middle class dudes because I didn't know any Asian game writers in, in 1992, um, who, one of whom, you know, convinced me he knew about Eastern philosophy and one of whom watched a lot of martial arts movies. I, I let them convince me that they were the right people for the project. One of the guys went, ah, I can't do this. and hopped off, leaving poor Emery, the, the, the Kung Fu movie fan, to give me a book in a few weeks. He wrote what he could. I did what I could with it, but we didn't have time to turn it into this masterpiece because the damn thing had to be out by such and such a take. Um, after Akashic Brotherhood, I took a harder line, which got me in trouble with, with management at times. I took a harder line and said, if the book sucks, it ain't going out, which is why the later Mage books we're frequently late, but our the quality is far better because I, I dug in my heels after the Akashic Brotherhood book and said, no more shitty books rushed out just to make a deadline. Ain't happening. I'm not going to do it. Um, not everybody had the same amount of... Had, had, not everybody was as stubborn as I was on that, and I did get in trouble over that frequently. Um, and sometimes justifiably because it, it, it is ultimately a business. Um, and, you know, a publishing company does have to make deadlines. Um, so some of the changing breed books, I was very, I was mostly happy with Best Debt. The, Ethan ended up having to cut about 20,000, 30,000 words out of it. Um, so I feel like it's kind of an awkward, it, it's not as good as it could have been. Um, but there are some of them, I, I, I rather like Nuisha. Um, I really like Korax. Rich, Rich Dansky did a marvelous job with the Korax book. Some of them, not as good as others for whatever reason, whether it was the author, the author's circumstances, or just their connection or lack of connection with the project or the deadline. Um, so that would be the long answer to the short question, why are some of them really good and why do some of them suck? That's true of all game books. Ultimately, they are the product of, hello, Finn. Ultimately, they are the product of, of the people who do them when they do them under the circumstances at which they do them. Yeah, they just, it's, the, the idea overall of the changing breeds sort of kind of bolted on there uh, in, in an odd kind of way. It, it was weird that there, there are some very interesting right. like an Ananasi, you can grab that book and you can run the hell out of that. <laughs> <laughs> very, very uh, that's you know, I saw mm -hmm. my plan to run at some point an Ananasi game, which I think would be. Very interesting, but then you know others like like the rat can uh, not. Uh, there are there are a lot of uh, a lot of bad puns and references in there that made it very difficult to read. Um, mm -hmm. Now let me uh, let me run through some of these. We have a load of questions, sir. I've been deleting a lot of them. So okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm like we've been talking about everything here, and we've been yeah. going for three hours now, and people are probably going, "Ran, read my question." He has Answer gone through a question. lot of your questions. I'm not going to ask him things that he's already <laughs> here. Uh, so your questions, I've been deleting them. Uh, sorry hmm. about that. I do appreciate you guys getting them in. I did I did read them. I did take them in, uh, but I'm going to try to get as many as we can. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, we had one question. It says this, and they, it's apparently. Uh, either either a joke to you or a real question. It says, yeah. to ask you, what do you have against shoes? And it says, no. <laughs> uh, okay. The short version of that is, um, the short version of that is, I don't like shoes. Shoes don't like me. Um, I find them uncomfortable. Uh, I find them uncomfortable and unhealthy. I worked in a shoe store for five years, which was the second worst job of my entire life. Um, and I had first-hand and first-nose experience with what wearing shoes all the time does to people's feet. Um, the, the, the back problems, the knee problems, the stink, the, 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 the fungus, the twisted up toes that people get by the time they're, they're 40 or 50 is because we take 
basically hands, the hands that we walk on, and we cram them into these, these you know, containers of synthetic material, wrap them up in something else, we put our weight on them all day for, you know, for a couple of decades, and then we wonder why they, they look and smell like this. If you don't wear shoes unless you have to, I mean, they're tools like anything else, like a jacket. You know, if it gets cold, put on a jacket. If you're, you know, if you're walking, if, if you're, you're going to a, um, you know, if you're going to a high class bar or a car, high class party or something like that, put on shoes. But if you don't need them, don't wear them. People think that you know feet smell bad and everything. It's because you know you're you're marinating your feet in um, dead skin cells and bacteria for all day long for for years on end. Um, having seen that and having also as a as working in a shoe store, seen the literally criminal. Um, shoe industry, practices of the shoe industry, um, and the effect that it has on people, both the people who make the shoes and the people who wear the shoes and the people who sell the shoes. Um, I was like, fuck them. Uh, part of it is also just, I like being in touch with my surroundings, and I am literally in touch with my surroundings. Um, the the book, um, Deerskin, Robin McKinley has her, her character at one point, who have Somebody asks her why she doesn't wear shoes, and she says, "You know, when when I uh, I like to know where I am, and when I'm wearing shoes, I just I'm just in shoes." I feel the same way. Um, part of it is part of it's also just I'm a total sensualist. Um, I like being in touch and touching, touching things, feeling the the you know feeling my my surroundings and so forth. So I enjoy that, and also sometimes uh, it's a spirit. There's an act of spiritual. Uh, devotion to it, it's kind of an energetic thing, and it's a whole lot of reasons. The ultimate reason, like I said, is I don't like shoes and shoes don't like me, therefore I wear them only when I have to, or if I want to for a certain occasion. All right, the legendary yeah. Mr. Shade writes, <laughs> uh, I'd like to know what themes Phil himself prefers within the setting. Which of them would be prominent in a media chronicle that you would be running? Uh, themes, as in like uh, story ideas, I guess. Okay. Um, so take take the, it however you want. <laughs> the that primary themes, and, and yeah, a number of them. The things that we've talked about, you know, that reality is what you think it is. That you are not powerless. Um, that you, if the minute you think that you know everything, you know nothing. Um, ideas like that. Um, when I have run mage games, uh, they've generally been. You know, they've, they've generally been one shots. I haven't run a mage chronicle just because that's when it was my job. That was my job. I want I let somebody else run it and I played in it. Um, and when it stopped being my job, I stopped being interested in it for a while. Um, but when I were running mage games, the, another one of the primary themes is that I have worked with is despite your differences, you must work together. So that one would be uh, that one would be true as well, and also that theme that I mentioned earlier with with my character um, and Dana McKinney's character of just look, open your eyes to the world around you, you know, see see the world on a much bigger and a much deeper scale because it's all there. So that okay, very good. Rude alert asks: <laughs> Do you plan to provide more rules? For the integration of resonance into the game, as opposed to keeping them as an almost purely open role play element, I prefer keeping them as an open role play element. I think, and this is not Jess's fault because this was something it was he was told to do. But I think making giving resonance a system was a mistake, especially making that, especially doing it fifty some odd books into the line. Um, resonance is to me, it's a role playing and storytelling element. To, to graft game mechanics onto it is to is is I think is is one adding more systems onto a game that's already got more systems than God. It's overcomplicating an already complicated game, um, and resonance is more is is so personal that you really can't. It's it's like the problem with with passions in Wraith. How do you describe what? four dots in anger is as opposed to two dots in anger or five dots in anger. Um, resonance is resonance is, is it's a flavor, it's an emotion. It's well it's not an emotion, but it comes from emotion. It's intensely personal. It doesn't lend itself well to to, to mechanics. So no. I am putting 
stuff in there about if you know integrating it in there. I feel like resonance <coughs> resonance was literally the first thing I added in terms of the setting. Um, resonance appears first in um, in the book of chantries in the idea that the chantries begin to resemble the people in them um, because of the resonance effect. I really do believe that. Um, I really do believe that you shape the world around you by by your views and your actions. Um, if you think if you see the world as a shitty place, you're going to have a shitty life, and the people around you are not going to be happy. Um, that's essentially what resonance is. You can't really graft a game mechanic onto that. Uh, I'm looking at, and I haven't written the, the rules system, the rules chapters all uh, completely just yet. I'm looking at maybe integrating some of the elements of the scourge from uh, from Sorcerer's Crusade, but again, I really don't want to add any game systems to a game that already has too many of them. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with your idea there. If you can keep something without a system keeping it, you know, the more you put a system in, the more closed off you make an idea. Why limit it? Uh, so yeah. I absolutely, certainly agree with your your uh, your thoughts there in terms of making the game world better. Uh, let me ask you this from Pete Jensen. I'm going to have to rephrase your question a little bit, Pete, because this is... <laughs> You, you could you could like spend like four hours answering it the way he did. Um, <laughs> probably. Basically, I think I he asked what what Pete wants is you know brand new players that say they've never played a role playing game before. Mm -hmm. They're coming in. You're going to run a game of mage. Do you do something different with them than you would someone who is experienced with a world of darkness? Oh yeah. Well, you make it you make it small. And there's there's a phrase that I use a lot in 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 Mage 20th Anniversary: intimate epic. And I also wrote I wrote the storytelling chapter in Werewolf 20th, which still hasn't come out yet. But I talk about you can have intimate, you know, you can you can move the focus from being an intimate story to a epic story. I'm going to be writing more about that in in Mage uh, 20th as well in the storytelling chapter. Um, but if you if you're dealing with somebody who either a is not familiar with with uh, with, with role playing games or B just doesn't want to play a game where the hit marks are storming down the street as the Nefendi swoop in from the sky. So let's jump off to our horizon realm and contact this, the, the shard, the, the shard realm of entropy. You can just go, you know, you, you you can go back to that story that I was mentioning earlier with Dina and with 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 uh, with Dina and me and the no, just see the world. And you can you can play people with one with an arete of one or two and open the game up gradually to a bigger and bigger and bigger and more epic level. In Deliria, and I may be copying some of this into Mage 20, I'm not sure yet, um, but in Deliria I, I, I talked about the um, circles of um, circles of influence. The circle of influence is basically, you know, when you start out, because one of the core elements in Deliria is innocence, transformation, is innocence, challenge, and transformation. You start out going, oh, my world is like this. Challenge goes, Psh, no, it does, no, it's not. Transformation is when you adjust to your circumstances and become bigger. Um, your spheres of influence grow outward the more you begin to re realize how big the world and your place in it actually are. Um, I would suggest running, an, uh, running a mage game for somebody who is not familiar with role-playing games as not jumping on a Quila machine and, and flying through the Umbra, but as just a person going... Oh crap! You know what? This this book is talking to me. Why is this book talking to me? Um, wow. Okay, I got this book at this bookstore. Wait a minute. That bookstore is open at four o'clock. What bookstore is open at four o'clock in the morning? Huh? Let's go find out. Hey, that dude. He he speaks in this weird accent. I've never heard it before. And make it start small. Make it intimate. Make it make it about your 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 character's relationship with with her boyfriend or um or you know where did his dog go. You know, and then make it bigger. If you even if you even want to make it bigger, one of the things also that I talk about in Mage Twentieth is that you don't have to have the Ascension War. It doesn't have to be about the technocracy and the traditions. You don't have to play somebody from this group or this group or this group. Uh, one of the things that I think people will enjoy with Mage Twentieth is it doesn't just give the traditions. There's a section for the traditions. There's a section section for the technocracy, there's a section for Nefandi, for Marauders, and for the Disparate, who we, we know as the Crafts, and we'll find out a lot more about the Disparates in Mage 20th. Um, 
and the idea that you could opt for none of the above. When I played Mage in the, the Mage game that Wayne Peacock was, was running and that Dina McKinney and I were playing in, um, Forrest Marchinson and various other people as well, um, my character, Jennifer Rollins, belonged to no group. She was like, fuck all y'all. I'm, I need to find my own way, and I don't want any part of your war, and I don't want any part of, of this thing that you're doing. I need to find my own way. You can always run a mage game like that. It doesn't have to be the epic. Hello, Finn. Apparently my other cat, Finn, wants, wants attention as well. He's been meowing at me for the last few minutes. So, um, yes, next question. All right, so you had talked about uh, before if Mage 20 is successful, if people get behind it, if it, if it does well, then we could see a... A uh, large number of other mage books coming back out, which you know would be quite wonderful. Now, Joe asked, uh, "Would you ever consider doing a revised edition of the Wilson Survival Guide?" Ah, I saw yeah, that book question. Was made of awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I don't know because I mean, on one hand, I love Orphan Survival Guide. That is, if if you ask me, I'm sure somebody probably did. If you ask me what my like my top five favorite mage books would be, Orphan Survival Guide would be one of them. Um, in case anybody's asked this question, I'll preempt it. Yeah. Fragile Path, well, Sorcerer's Crusade, Fragile Path, Orphan Survival Guide, uh, Infernalism, and Cult of Ecstasy would be my my pick of my personal favorites. With um, uh, with with uh, Digital Web 2.0, Technomancer's Toy Box, um, Technocracy Syndicate, Guide to the Technocracy would be up there as well. Um, but going going back, oh and Sorcerer's Crusade Companion, which is also one of my favorites. Um, but going going back to, um, I don't want, and I'm not saying I'm not going to do this. So please don't don't light up the internet going. He said he's not going to do this, but I don't want to do rehashes of, of stuff that we've already done, unless it absolutely positively needs to be fixed. And Jess took care of most of that. Um, thank you, Jess, for the or for the uh, for Akashic Brotherhood Second Edition, which. Just another side note here to add on to these tangents, but people go, the second edition books are so much better than the first one. Yeah, they're three times the word count. <laughs> you can say a lot more in 60,000 words than you can in 15 or, or 18. Um, they're, 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 they weren't limited to 72 pages, so of course they have more stuff in them. But it's anyway, going back... words long? Huh? The what? How many words long did you say they were? The original Splat books, the 72 ones, most of the vampire ones were between 15 and fifteen and 18, maybe 20,000. I pushed the limits on how much you could fit into 72 pages, um, which is why production cursed my name on a frequent basis. Um, the absolute maximum that I got out of that was about 23,000 words. Maybe it was 20, 20, uh, 23 to 26, I forget, it's been years, but on, on um, Order of Hermes. But like Cult of Ecstasy is 22, I think. Dream Speakers was 22 or 23. You can only get so much into 72 pages without making the type microscopic. Um, the other, the later, the, the the revised edition books, they're what 60 something pages? Oh, not 60. They're all 100 and something pages. I know the word counts on those were like 50, 60 thousand. Of course, there was more material in them. Um, but going back to, I, I don't. I would rather not do revised editions of stuff. I would rather do new stuff. There's plenty of room to go. When when I stopped doing Mage in in uh, in '98 slash '99 on the cusp of that, I still had years worth of, of books. Um, Jess did a few of them. A lot of them got discarded. Some of them I've added onto the. This is what I'd like to do if the Mage if the Mage line continues to go. I want to do a Mage, the Steam Age. You know, pulp, pulp, punk. Steampunk, steam pulp, whatever you want to call it. Steam pulp was a word that I used. The Mad Mask, the book about marauders, um, you know, Book of the Fallen, um, the Disparate Alliance. I want to do also. I've, I've got ideas for books like the Rich Bastard's Guide to Magic, which would be, you know, essentially a player's guide for playing an obscenely a player and storyteller guide for playing an obscenely wealthy mage and what the kind of magic power that money has. Um, I want to do new stuff. I don't want to do the a new edition of such and such unless unless it actually needs it. Um, I feel like that was a, a a weakness of the later Mage the Ascension books was, well, let's do revised edition Sorcerer. Let's do revised edition Book of Madness. Let's do revised edition, and it just became rehashes. Yeah, and that's 
Mage is supposed to be dynamic. You know, it's supposed to be new stuff. The primary book I would love to do, and again, fans, Onyx Path is fan supported. If you want it, please vote with your money. Um, and I know that sounds crass, but it's true. It takes money to do these things. If you want to have these books, please support them because it's not Onyx Path is not White Wolf. It's not you know a warehouse with with a bunch of office buildings and a bunch of people on salary churning these things out. The books on Onyx Path get done only if the fans want to see them. They will get done only if the money to produce them, to pay the artists, to pay the authors, to pay the editors. Um, if that money is there, those books will get done. If the money's not there, they're not going to. I would love to keep doing Mage as long as the fans continue to support Mage and continue to want to see books, we'll continue doing them. Um, but with, with um, the, the, the book that I, probably, that I want to do probably more than anything else is Mage the, new, is Mage the New Millennium. That would be, this is what happened in between, yeah. you know, when last we saw our intrepid heroes. Mage 20th is going to have elements of, it has elements of, where things have been since 2000, where Mage, you know, when, when Mage Revised came out, but things have changed a lot in the last 13 years, a lot, a lot, and there are things in Mage the Ascension that desperately need to be changed, like the Dream Speakers, um, there are things, you know, the Akashic Brotherhood, um, these things that are really outmoded that need to be changed, and there's a bunch of new things I want to do. Mage the New Millennium will be what I will, will be what where those things will go if again if the fans support them. I have ideas. That's wonderful to hear. I know a lot of people are definitely going to be very much looking forward to that. Now you all want to get out there and hit that Kickstarter. Uh, hit the Kickstarter for all the you know not just Mage but for all these new White Wolf books to be coming out. We could really see uh, some wonderful products coming out. If, uh, like I said, if you want them, so if you want them, you know, mm -hmm. and get them. Um, I have one last question here. This is from Devin. He says, "What is okay. the mage?" He goes, uh, "What do you think of Awakening as a successor to Ascension?" I knew somebody was going to ask that question. Oh, yeah, <laughs> more than one person did, but he's the one that gets it in. That's it's it's not an easy question to answer because. Uh, Bill and I are Bill and I are old friends, and like I said, we, we because because we spent a lot of time together in college in this what I call the, the metaphysical weirdos group, yeah. sitting around and talking about metaphysics at you know midnight and so forth with half the people in the room. Not Bill. Bill never did drugs that I'm aware of, but half the people in the room tripping and so forth. Um, I know what Bill was getting at with Mage the Awakening, and the main thing that he was getting at besides some of the hermetic ideas that he was putting in there was, as he said, and he, I think he was absolutely, um, he was, he was absolutely successful with this. He said, "I really wanted to make it different than Mage: The Ascension." He said, "People were complaining that Requiem was not different enough from from um, from um, uh, Arn, <laughs> from Masquerade, and you know, Forsaken was not different enough from uh, from Apocalypse." I wanted to make Awakening very different than Mage the Ascension. He succeeded. I haven't been able to read the damn thing. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's so dense. Also that the ink, I, I just hate it. The ink makes my, my dyslexia explode. Um, little tiny type in reflective ink is a bad idea if you've got the dyslexia. Um, I think there are a lot of really good ideas in it, but I think it is... I think it is so esoteric and so, arc uh, so arcane that that it throws off everybody but the most dedicated fan. There are a lot of dedicated fans. My girlfriend Coyote is one of them. Um, there are a lot of dedicated fans and, and it absolutely hits certain bases very well. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't speak to me personally. Um, I think Bill and especially the, the uh, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Charles Vess. It was Charles Vess or Michael Kaluta, I forget which. It's been years since I looked at it. Did beautiful, gorgeous artwork. It is one of the best looking game books I've ever seen. It's just really hard to read physically and, and otherwise. So I haven't gotten far enough into it to give it a fairer appraisal than that. Yeah, I have to agree with your comments on as far as looking at it and being sort of un, uh, un, unpleasant to look at the particular game. Um, in, in, term, in terms of actually reading. Uh, making, making book. So, yeah, I definitely agree with you there. 
Uh, okay. Well, let's. Uh, let me ask you this then. Sure. Talk about your experience with Onyx App. What do you think about the company? How how has it been so far? Yay, rich. <laughs> like I said a, a while ago, and, and people watching by now are probably like, huh, what did he say? Because we said this like two and a half hours ago. Yeah. But Richard Thomas is the savior of the world of darkness. I cannot thank him highly enough for that. Rich, if you're listening, if you're, if you're, if you're watching this, thank you very much because you're making a lot of people very happy. And he is working his ass off doing it. Um, Onyx Path is a new model is, is a new model for, for doing the biggest problem well the biggest there are a number of but one of the largest problems with, with paper based role playing since um, since massive multiplayer online gaming came around came along is that um, the the audience has shrunk to the point where you can't make your expenses unless you've got a, an audience willing to, to pay you know, willing to, to pay for it. And this is something some people will go, oh my God, he's gonna talk about commerce. What a mercenary, but this is the truth. That's what you're here for. There's a huh? The what? No, that's what you're here for, please. We we want yeah. there is a hell of a lot of work involved in putting even the smallest gaming book together. Yeah. Not just the not just the writing, not just the play testing, not just the illustration, not just the editing, not just the all the words that get written that never see print. Um, there's the support, there's the, the, the typesetting, there's the layout, there's the proofing process. All of these things take enormous amounts of time and work. And you can't, when you're 20, you can go, I'm going to do this because it's fun. You cannot publish professional level books because it's fun. Ultimately, the people working on them have to get compensated for the work that they are doing because it, it is a lot of work, a lot of time to do it. Um, and because it was easier to, to, to put out a, to put out six books a month, eight books a month, when there were multi-million dollar companies drawing in millions of dollars a year or tens of millions of dollars a year to do it. That hasn't been happening. That, that um, paper-based role-playing has shrunk to the point where there are a few thousand people worldwide playing it, and even a lot of those people are playing the games that were released 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, the amount of income to produce new product, and I'm, I'm saying I'm deliberately using the word product as opposed to, you know, you know, book or game in that sense, because there is a business, there is a sense of business that must be adhered to if you want to do this more than once, uh, much less do it, you know, do dozens of them. Um, that there is a certain amount of, of there's a certain amount of money that must be there in order to produce a book. Um, and the amount of money to produce those books has gone down as the, as the expectations of, of the field have gone up. You couldn't get away with publishing a book like, like, like a Vampire First Edition now. Um, it was radical when it came out, but the, the, the writing, the typesetting, the art, aside from the, the Tim Bradstreet pieces, is, is crap. By, by current standards. The standards went up, the income went down, so there needed to be a new model to bridge that gap. Kickstarter, which is one of the greatest things since like the internet, um, has given us a model where fans can say, I want such and such a book, I want such and such a miniatures line, I want such and such a movie, I want such and such a novel, a comic, whatever, I will pay you to make it. That's great, that's wonderful, I love it, and Rich just as we did with Ravens in the Library, Rich ran with the okay. If the fans will, if the fans will build it, we will come, or if the fans will will, will pay for it, we will build it, and then then everybody will be happy. Um, and Rich, it, it is working. It's working very well. Partly because Rich is a hard worker. Partly because he Rich is basically getting the band back together, getting the people who who love doing this stuff together, and getting the fans and 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 both new fans and old fans together to go, wow, this is neat. Yeah, I want to be a part of this. In one of our early discussions when, when we were first, tar first started talking about Mage 20th, Rich said something that I think is, is very important. He said, I want to get the magic back. You know, he said, by the, by, by the, by the later... By the, by, the, by the later CCP years, before CCP finally decided to get out of the paper-based role-playing game, he's like, it wasn't fun anymore. 
it was just meeting deadlines and putting out product. And, you know, they were still putting out good stuff. Changeling to Dreaming, as I said to you last night, is I think one of the finest things White Wolf in any incarnation has ever produced. Changeling, Changeling to Dreaming, rather. Changeling the Lost, sorry. Not, not, to, not to down Ian or, or anybody involved with Changeling the Dreaming, but Changeling the Lost fucking rocked my world. I think it's one of the best things White Wolf's ever produced. Very popular game. Um, it's really, really good. Um, and and yet, he said, you know, the magic had gotten out of it. It was just a grind. Onyx Path and Rich have brought the magic back. The fans are supporting the magic. The creators, we feel energized again. Um, Mage 20th has basically been writing itself because having gotten out of my burnt out phase a while ago, I'm loving it. I'm getting back in there. <clears throat> Um, I will I, I, I will be glad to do this as long as I continue to get paid for it, as long as Rich continues to get paid for it, as long as the artists continue to get paid for it, and as long as the fans are happy. Um, I don't want it, you know, I don't want to wear wear the wear the thing out to the point where folks are like, Oh god, I don't have to buy another fucking book. Dudes, you know, I only make such and such and we got this complaint a lot, sometimes justifiably in the old days of dude, I, I only make this amount of money. Pete, quit putting out you know six books a month that I have to buy. We're only putting things out. Onyx Path is putting things out if the fans support them. I think they're doing an excellent job at that, and I'm really glad they are. And again, thank you, Rich. You totally fucking rule. Because it wouldn't be happening without him. Well, uh, in closing, is there anything else that you, you, you'd like to mention, <laughs> that, you plug, that you'd like to uh, uh, tell the people about that you're getting involved with? Um... Well, let's see. Um, I have my, uh, well, we, I should say, have our webcomic, Arpeggio. If you like Mage, you will probably like Arpeggio. It's arpeggiothecomic.com. This is, it's an urban comic, uh, rather an urban, uh, an urban fantasy webcomic about an ur uh, a clueless teenage bard and her sort of ma musical and magical misadventures, um, which is not nearly as lighthearted as it sounds. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty dark at points. Um, I've really been enjoying that, my, and my uh, my collaborator Brian Syme has been doing a wonderful job with it. Um, there is Power Chords, uh, Music, Magic, and Urban Fantasy, which I mentioned earlier. That's this that's this monstrosity here. It's in editing right now. It'll be going to uh, it'll be going to lay out when the when the editing is done and when the uh, uh, when the the editing and, and the illustrations are finished. That is a new line coming out from, from my company, from mine and, my, and Sandra Buskirk's company, Quiet Thunder Productions, under the Silver Seder uh, Silver Seder Studio um, imprint. That is a a um, a game uh, RPG based on being a being a being a musical musician, a magical musician. I'm sorry, we've been talking for like four hours now. Um, but being a magical musician in the world of, of, of magic and music uh, is a pro it's it is a very it's a project very very dear to me, which as I mentioned a few hours ago started as a small supplement and expanded into this huge thing just because I found that I love music I love magic and this combines them both that's not out yet but it will be in a few months um, and there's well, there's a Delirious currently on hiatus. Uh, Goblin Markets is available, but I'm not doing any Deliria books for a little while anyway, uh, just because I, I don't have time. Um, but said so there. Oh, yes, the Dream Dance, uh, the Dream Dance Oracle, which is a project I'm working on with fantasy artist Stephanie Puimun Law. Uh, she and I have been collaborating on that for about eight months now, and we're about halfway through it. We'll be we'll be releasing that through through Quiet Thunder. Uh, probably a year, year and a half from now, we'll put up the Kickstarter when we're ready. Um, and there is a project I, I cannot mention. I cannot mention the name of it just yet. But uh, there is a collaboration with Ben Dobbins, uh, artist Tess Fowler, and myself, which I think is going to rock a lot of people's worlds. Uh, if you're not familiar with Tess Fowler, she is a marvelous comic artist. Used to work for Dark Horse, uh, is now working as an independent, and. Um, it's it's based on this is something that people haven't seen before it's 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 original but Ben Dobbins and I worked on a screenplay several years ago and it ended up being too ambitious to produce but we decided to make a web comic out of it uh, not a web comic rather a graphic novel out of it um, that will be there will be more information about that as things come together on the Zombie Orpheus Entertainment website and my own uh, and my own sites as well I also do political blogging though I haven't had much time for that lately. 
No, I am busy as fuck. Oh, yes, and I've also got a, uh, a short story collection called The Legacy Box, which will be coming out at some point when I finish revising the last story in it. This is all stories that, with, with two exceptions, have already been published um, in other... It's not White Wolf. These are stories that... Uh, uh, story, these are stories that I've done for other books uh, and for other uh, magazines. It's frequently forgotten... <laughs> that I started as a short story writer and over the years I've been publishing with realms of fantasy with um, uh, with with weird tales with a collection of, oh yes there's also an anthology that I was just in uh, just came out a few weeks ago called deep cuts it's a horror anthology I have a story in this as well um, this is available from Amazon there are a number of I've got stories coming out in like four anthologies coming up the urban green man anthology um, the dark, the darkness of thine eye, which is a uh, a queer Poe anthology, um, and I'm not using the word queer derogatorily. That's that's the uh, that's the editor's word. Um, there's another anthology about historical zombies, but I've completely forgotten what the name of it is. Um, the Legacy Box will be collecting short stories that I have written and published in various different places, all together in one book. Um, I said that'll we'll be putting that one out at some point, probably within the next year, but it's not available yet. So yes, busy as fuck. <laughs> yeah, <but laughs> like lots of stuff. A ton of stuff that you put together, working out there. And I'm going to get a bunch of uh, links from you a after we go off here, so I can plug them back in, so that you guys watching don't have to try to uh, rewind or anything. Just go hit the yeah bar, and you can you can find this stuff, and you can jump on there. Remember, support Onyx Path. Support. Yes. If you love White Wolf, keep keep the White Wolf running on its path. <laughs> yes. Keep keep the White Wolf running down that dark path. Absolutely. That's what we want to see. That's what we want to see all of you guys do and really get at support games. You know, we we get the opportunity to see this coming back, mm -hmm. and it could come back in a big way. Vampire could come back in a big way. Werewolf in a big way, and we could really see uh, that thing that we love. So many of us from our our youth, uh, these wonderful ideas that got us into that immersive style of role playing coming back to the forefront and I think that's certainly where our hobby needs to be going it needs to be going away from uh, from, from the stagnant uh, role to hit sort of model to well, what is the character doing what's the psychology what's the thoughts and that really traces mm -hmm. back to White Wolf that's such a revolutionary innovative idea set of games that were put out um, so yeah. I would certainly first of all Seder I would like to thank you for not only myself but for uh, that, that watch this uh, for the tremendous amount of work that you've done for books like this, for books like this, for books that uh, have come out for the, full of ecstasy, for all the bits and pieces you've done for the world of darkness, uh, the great imagining the pieces that you have provided for us to explore and for us to learn and elevate our own games and the, the role in, that you have played in that, not only for myself but for many, many other people out there who, who, who get what you were doing here with the Mage game, who, who want to understand and experience that plot. So personally, I would like to extend my thanks okay. for doing that. And then on another level, thank you. thank you very much for coming on, for doing this interview. It was insightful. Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was long. <laughs> well, it was expansive and covered a, a great deal. Uh, and it was, um, you know, quite Quite, quite, quite enjoyable to, to have you here, and uh, I believe, as you said yourself, I said, uh, to write is to tell the truth, and that is what you've done. You've come on here, you've told the truth, you've let the people, the ruling and just the masses out there, know just just what it is you, you think and the ideas. We wouldn't have ever had any idea behind certain things, and I personally thank you very much for doing that, for coming on here for the interview. Thank you, and thank you as well. Thank you, thank you for today. Thank you for doing this in general. Thank you for all of the wonderful work that you that you are doing, that you have done, that you continue to do. I really, really appreciate this. Uh, I appreciate you're wonderful to talk to. I'm I'm having a ball here. Obviously, we, we've been going for a while because we're we're having a good time with it. But I really, I really, really appreciate you, Anders, for for the main man, for for being the main, main man. man. This man. You you are you are moving heaven and earth for all of this, and mo having moving heaven, earth, and internet for all of this. I really appreciate it. I know that Mark really appreciated it, and thank you. This like goes out to everybody who is watching or ever will watch this. Thank you all very much to the fans. Thank you to the creators, and thank you to the people who make this happen. Because as I said at the beginning of this interview, I didn't do this myself. No one of us did this ourselves. 
this is what we made. And we is, it's you, you know, it's, it's you, Anders, it's you, the fans, it's you, whoever is watching this. You could be watching this 10 years from now, and I'm still, and it's still true, I'm still talking to you right now. You made this. We made this. This is communion. It's one of the reasons that I still enjoy role-playing after all these years, both as a medium, as a creator, and as a role-player because it is collaboration and connection and communion. It's something we do together. And we've had, we, we live in a world where people are constantly trying to drive us apart and divide us into these little boxes. Thank you for not falling for the fucking bullshit. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for playing. Thank you for reading. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you and thank you. <laughs>